today I want to show everyone something called the Gateau derivative as well as a certain property that holds for the regular derivative that does not hold for the Gateau derivative. But in order to study this fancy derivative, we need to recall what a directional derivative is. So let's do that. So the directional derivative of a function f, which has a domain of Rn, so like n-dimensional vectors, and a codomain, or like a target space of the real numbers. So in other words, the inputs are n-dimensional vectors and the outputs are just numbers. Okay, so anyway, the directional derivative of that in the direction of a vector v is defined as follows. So this is, of course, if this limit exists. So we've got dvf, is the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h times v minus f of x all over h. Okay, so let's look at a nice simplification that occurs in R2, in other words, the plane. So we've got multivariable functions with just two variables. And this is of course like if everything is nice. And of course the example we'll look out later, everything will not be nice, but of course like when you're looking at weird examples, you expect not everything to be so nice. Okay, so anyway, let's look at this. So we've got the derivative in the direction of V of F is equal to the limit as H goes to zero of F of X plus AH y plus bh minus f of xy, and then this is gonna be all over h. Okay, so that just mimics this over here, right? Because in this world, we have like x is equal to x comma y, or maybe written as xy a column vector. And then of course, like, x plus hv will just turn into this when we're putting it into the multivariable function. Okay, nice. But from here, we'll add and subtract the same thing. In other words, we're gonna add the number zero. And we're gonna simultaneously split this into two limits. So this may seem like a little cheesy, but like I said, we're working in the case where everything is nice. And this is just to give some intuition for how the directional derivative works in all like good circumstances. Okay, so what will I add and subtract? <clears throat> well, there are a couple of choices, but what we'll choose here is the following thing. We're gonna do plus minus f of x comma y plus bh. Okay, great. So let's do that. So we'll have the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus ah y plus bh minus f of x comma y plus bh. So that's from the subtraction part of that. And then this is all gonna be over h. And then of course we're gonna have the addition part of this as well as this term, but this is where I'll split this into two limits. And so that'll be plus the limit as h goes to zero of, well let's see what we have, f of x comma y plus bh minus f of x y all over h. So something that looks like that. Now I guess like one of the most important things to notice at this stage is that this element right here and this element right here are the same. So maybe I'll give these things a name. I'll call them yh. And I guess really importantly is that these approach y as h approaches zero. I mean I think that's pretty clear. Okay. So what I'd like to do now is do a change of variables in each of these limits to turn this a times h into just like one thing that's trending towards zero. Okay, so what will that be? So in this first limit, perhaps I'll set h1 equal to a h. So in other words, I'm gonna set h equal to h1 over a. Now I'll have the limit as h1 goes to zero of f of x plus h1 comma yh minus f of x comma yh, where I'm using that notation. 
And I guess maybe I should put H1 here, but we're just gonna let that go. All over, well, I had H right here, but now H is H1 over A, so this A is gonna pop into the numerator right here and leave us with an H1 right here. And then I guess I should say that since we have A times H here, that's how that became just H1 by our substitution. Now we'll do something like kind of similar over here. We're gonna set H equal to H2 over B. So like I said, that's a pretty similar substitution. And likewise, that's gonna pop a B out front for essentially the same reason. And then we'll have the limit as H2 goes to zero of f of x comma y plus h2 minus f of x y all over h2. But now since these two entries are the same, this yh and this yh, and they're both uh, limiting to this y, I can actually just turn these from yh to y. Again, because they're both approaching this y. And again, of course here we're using the fact that this is a really nice function. But now this is exactly the definition of something. And when I say this, maybe I'll like put a brown box over this. This limit is exactly the partial derivative of f with respect to x. So we can see that because we're holding y as a constant and we're taking the derivative with respect to x. And so there's that notion right here, partial f partial x, but there's also this subscript notation, this like f sub x. So that's what we have there. And likewise over here, we have the limit definition of the partial with respect to y for essentially the same reason. So there we have that. So we could have partial f partial y or f sub y. So let's see, this turns into a times f sub x plus b times f sub y. But we're working in a multivariable world and sometimes we'd like to translate this into a vector language. And we can see immediately that this is the vector function made up by fx, fy, dot producted with our vector a, b, which our vector a, b was this v over here. And then of course this thing has a name as well. This is called the gradient. So this is the gradient of f dot producted with the original vector. And so if you're like taking a multivariable calculus class, almost all of the time you can use this version of the directional derivative. So instead of mucking about with these limits and stuff, to take this directional derivative, all you have to do is take the gradient and dot product it with the direction that you're aiming to go in. Now that we've kind of recalled what this directional derivative is, we can go ahead and define the Gateau derivative. So the Gateau derivative is defined as follows. So we switch up our view of what is a variable and what is like maybe a fixed parameter or something. So with the directional derivative, our x and y are variables, and we're fixing this vector v and looking at the directional derivative in that direction. Whereas the Gateau derivative, we view v as a variable and we fix x. And then the Gateau derivative, well, it's simply the same thing as the directional derivative, except we've swapped in our mind who's playing the role of the variable. And this Gateau derivative shares some of the same properties as the regular derivative, but not all of them. In particular, in one variable calculus, we have the following like nice result that says if f is differentiable at a point f x naught, in other words, f prime of x naught exists, then that implies that f is continuous at x naught. In other words, the limit as x approaches x naught of f of x is in fact equal to f of x naught. That's a pretty easy proof. We won't do it here, but you learn that in like a first semester calculus class. But this is not true with the Gateau derivative. So in other words, we should be able to find some function, perhaps we'll keep it easy so it's a function of two variables, that is Gateau differentiable somewhere, let's say maybe at 0, 0, the origin, but it is not continuous at 0, 0. 
And this is the type of function that we'll look at from here until the end of the video. So we're gonna consider the following function. So we'll call it f, and when xy is not the origin, it's equal to x to the fourth y over x to the sixth plus y cubed. But when xy is the origin, this is equal to zero. And we'll start by showing that this is not continuous at the origin. And then we'll finish off by showing that it is Gateau differentiable at the origin. Meaning that this like derivative here does not have that same property as the derivative from first semester calculus. So how will we show that it's not continuous? Well, we'll show that its limit does not exist. And since this limit does not exist, well then it can't be equal to the value of the function for sure. And how do we show that multivariable limits don't exist? Well, the classic way of doing it is to approach, in this case, the origin from a couple of different curves and show that we do not achieve the same limit from you know, different curves. Well, of course, from some curves you'll achieve the same limit, but not all of them. Okay, so let's branch up here, and let's say we're gonna approach along the curve y equals zero. In other words, up here we're approaching along the x-axis. So if y is already zero, this collapses to the limit as x approaches zero of, oh, well look at this, the numerator is already zero over the denominator, which is now x to the six, but that limit is simply zero because that's just the constant function, zero. Okay, but now let, let's branch off this other way as well and go along the curve y equals x squared. And what do we get there? Well, now this is going to collapse to the limit as x goes to zero, but now the numerator will be x to the fourth times x squared, which is x to the six over, well, that'll be x to the six, and then x squared cubed, which is another x to the six. Well, that's also a constant function of one half. But clearly, zero is not equal to a half, so this limit does not exist. If the limit does not exist, it cannot be continuous at the origin. So we've showed that. Now let's show that it is Gateau differentiable. So now we'll show that f is Gateau differentiable at the origin, thus showing that that property from calculus one does not hold with this derivative. So we need to calculate the Gateau derivative at the origin. Well, that's simply the directional derivative with our mind tricked into having v be the variable. Okay, so here this is gonna be the limit as h goes to zero of f of well, it's gonna be zero plus AH because we're going from the origin. So in other words, AH, and then zero plus BH, so in other words, BH, minus F of zero, zero, all over H. But we know exactly what F of zero, zero is by the definition of our function, and this is simply equal to zero. So now we can plug some things in here, and we have this is the limit as H goes to zero of one over h, so I'll just take that h in the denominator and write it as one over h, and then f evaluated at a h b h will be equal to, well, it's gonna be b to the fifth, and then a to the fourth times b, so that's the numerator here, and then here we'll have h to the six, a to the six, plus h cubed b cubed, that's what's going on in the denominator. Okay, but let's notice that we can factor a h cubed out of the denominator. That's gonna bump this thing up to h to the fourth. Then I can just scrub this h cubed out and scrub this one down to, let's see, h cubed. And then I can simplify. Okay, that should have been an h to the fifth there. I can simplify leaving an h in the numerator. So in other words, this will cancel this down to just an h. So in other words, now I'll have the limit as h goes to zero of h times a to the fourth times b over h cubed times a to the six plus b cubed. But now if we let h approach zero there, we clearly get zero. Because the numerator approaches zero, whereas the denominator approaches b cubed. And you might be worried about the case, well, what if a and b are both zero? Well, in that case, you can define this in terms of another limit as a and b approach zero, zero, and you'll get the same result. I'll leave that for you.
Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.